Good evening. Today marks the end of one month since the terror attacks that left the island in shock. The victims of the gruesome attacks were remembered today in various religious observances organized in the country. While remembering those who lost their lives in the April 21st attacks, we at News First hope for a speedy recovery of all those who were injured in the explosions. With that being said, let's start off with a look at the headlines. DNA report confirms the death of Zaran. Arrested parliamentary staff are brought to parliament for further investigations. BIG Nalika de Silva released on bail. US delays Huawei ban for 90 days. Starting off with our top story this evening. Now, DNA tests have confirmed the identities of all suicide bombers responsible for the April 21st terror attacks, including that of Mohammed Zara. Colombo, Shangri-La Hotel. There were two explosions at the Shangri-La Hotel in Colombo. The second suicide bomber responsible for the attack on the Shangri-La Hotel and the suicide bomber responsible for the attack at the Cinnamon Grand Hotel in Colombo were Mohammed Ibrahim Elham Ahmad and Mohammed Ibrahim Inshaf Ahmad. The government analyst department has confirmed that the DNA of the suicide bombers matched with the DNA samples of their father. The government analyst department has confirmed that the DNA of Achi Mohammed Mohammedu Hastun the suicide bomber responsible for the attack on the Katuapitiya church was a match to the samples obtained from his parents. The government analyst department also confirmed that the DNA of Allahuddin Ahmad Muath, the suicide bomber responsible for the attack on the Kochikade church in Colombo, was a match to the samples obtained from his parents. The DNA of Abdul Latif Jamil Mohammed, the suicide bomber responsible for the explosion at the Tropic Inn in Dehivala, was a match to the samples obtained from his wife and children. The DNA of Mohammed Nazar Mohammed Azad, the suicide bomber responsible for the attack on the Batiklo church, was a match to the samples obtained from his mother. The DNA of Mohammed Azam Mohammed Mubarak, the suicide bomber responsible for the attack on the Kingsbury Hotel, was a match to the samples obtained from his wife and children. The DNA of Mohammed Fatima Jeffrey, responsible for the explosion at Demetagoda, was a match to Mohammed Ibrahim Ilham Ahmad, her husband. In addition, the government analysts confirmed that three children who died in the explosion were the children of Fatima Jeffrey and Mohammed Ibrahim Ilham Ahmad. Mohammed Qasim Mohammed Zaharan was one of the suicide bombers who triggered the explosion at the Shangri-La Hotel. The government analyst confirmed that the DNA obtained was a match to his wife. Now the parliamentary staffer who was arrested for his alleged involvement in the national Tauhi Jamaat was brought to the parliamentary complex for further investigations. Parliamentary Sergeant at Arms Narendra Fernando said that the suspect was brought into the parliamentary complex by officers of the Criminal Investigations Department. He added that investigations were conducted on the equipment used by the suspect and the duties he performed in the past. The Ministry of Defence previously granted permission to the police to detain and question the arrested parliamentary staffer for a period of three months. The arrested suspect, a 45-year-old Muslim residing in Kandy, was serving as a senior indexing officer attached to the Hansard Department of Parliament. All steps have been taken to ensure the security of all parliamentarians. A parliamentary staffer has also been taken into custody. Investigations are being conducted into the matter. We will focus our attention on that matter daily. Therefore, as inaccurate reports and voice cuts in parliament can cause a chaotic situation in the country, I request the honourable MPs to be attentive on the matter. We would like to know, Honourable Speaker, if you have been given any in-depth and accurate information, not only of this incident, but about the security situation in whole, because it has been a month since these attacks. We receive reports on the security situation daily from the intelligence units, the police and the chief officers of the army. At the first instance, it was not a parliamentary staffer, but a subcontractor of the RDA who built the parliamentary road. He was nabbed while in possession of plans of the parliamentary complex. He is currently in police custody. 
Investigations are ongoing into the incident. The second incident occurred on the day before yesterday. I was called at about 9 that night by a police officer who inquired information on this individual. I immediately contacted the General Secretary and this man was arrested. It was only afterwards that they found out that he too was connected to this. Investigations are ongoing. I received a report today as well. No one is reported to have been involved in this. Myself, together with the General Secretary and the Sergeant at Arms of Parliament and the rest of the staff are focusing their attention on this. Yesterday, we met at a free cabinet meeting under the auspices of the Prime Minister at Temple Trees. During this free cabinet meeting, the Prime Minister discussed the current security situation. He said that there are 80 people who are wanted in connection to the attack. 79 out of the 80 suspects have been arrested. There is only one more person who is wanted. So when these investigations continue, all of the people who are wanted in connection to the attacks will be arrested. Under the current situation, it is hard for us to believe that the parliament is safe and secure. We hope that the parliament is not attacked. If there is such an attack, we hope that the Prime Minister is in the chambers during the attack. Still in news from Parliament this evening, now security agreements alleged to have been established with the US government were questioned in Parliament today. The SOFA agreement will provide immunity to foreign servicemen of the U.S. Security Department and others affiliated organizations on Sri Lankan soil. They will not be subject to any security checks. If such individuals commit any wrongdoings in Sri Lanka, we cannot bring them to account within the legal framework in the country. The matter will be considered within the U.S. legal system. On the other hand, the ASCA agreement provides for joint military cooperation between Sri Lanka and the United States and includes logistic support, supplies, service and the use of airports and ports during unforeseen circumstances. It empowers the U.S. Army to establish army camps even at the center of the island. These are serious agreements. It paves the way for foreigners, including Americans, to acquire hundreds of thousands of acres in Sri Lanka. These are agreements that affect the future generation of our country. None of these agreements were present in Parliament. We request that all these agreements be presented in Parliament. I would like to remind MP Viravansa that it was Gotabe Rajpaksa who first signed the ASCA agreement in 2007 without the knowledge of anyone. The second section of the SOFA agreement is currently under discussion. However, it is yet to be signed. Do not raise your voice. Let me speak. The tenure of Gota Bay Rajpaksa was during the LTTE war period. A 10-page agreement was signed and we agree. However, the agreement only allows U.S. ships to pump oil and stock up food supplies. However, your government has now converted this to an 80-page agreement. It has been 12 years since Gotabaya Rajapaksa signed this agreement in 2007. Therefore, this agreement must be renewed. The agreements with the United States of America was also discussed on Face the Nation program aired on TV1 last night. Dated on 1st of November 2018, the Attorney General very clearly states it is observed that some of the covenants violate the inalienable laws, applicable laws in the Sri Lanka, uh, government of Sri Lanka, including Article 3 of the Constitution. What is Article 3? Article 3 of the Constitution provides, it states, the sovereignty in the Republic in the people of Sri Lanka, which include the legislative power, the executive power, and the judicial power. So it identify, he identifies the second agreement proposed by the United States directly violates the Constitution. DIJ Nalika De Silva, who was in charge of the Terrorist Investigation Department and was arrested and remanded over an alleged plot to assassinate high-profile individuals, was released on bail today. DIG Nalika De Silva, who was produced before the Fort Magistrate Ranga Desainayaka, was released on a cash bail of 25,000 rupees and two sureties of 5 million rupees. The magistrate barred the former DIG from travelling overseas and ordered for the immigration and emigration controller to be notified of this. 
DIG Nalaka De Silva was arrested on the 25th of October last year over an alleged plot to assassinate President Maitripada Sirisena and the former Defence Secretary Gotabe Rajapaksha. The case will be taken up for hearing again on the 26th of July. He was in remand custody for about seven months. With regard to the recent terrorist attacks, the DIG, while he was the head of the terrorist investigation department, had taken steps to arrest members of the Tawheed Jamaat and Zaharan as well. Facts were reported to courts on the 17th of February that these individuals are preparing for a terrorist attack and said that he is a person who spreads extremist ideas and that they should be arrested. The Attorney General was informed to ban this organization three times. I have a huge suspicion if remanding this person was aiding in the terrorist attacks. Well, that story was where the AG Nalikate Silva, who was in charge of the terrorist investigation division, uh, and was arrested and remanded over an alleged plot to assassinate high-profile individuals who was uh, released on bail today. Moving on, a number of parties have gone to court citing that their fundamental rights were violated as action was not taken to prevent the April 21st terror attacks. Today, the petitions filed by a father who lost his two children in the attacks and a businessman attached to the tourism sector citing the people's fundamental rights were violated by the former Defence Secretary and IGP as they failed to prevent the attacks on the 21st, despite having prior information on the attacks, were taken up. The petition was taken up before Supreme Court Justices Bhuvaneka Luvihare, LTB Dehidenia and Preeti Patman Surasena. President's Council Anuja Premaratna and President's Council Krishma Varnasurya appeared for the IGP and the former Defence Secretary named as respondents in the fundamental rights petition filed by the father who lost his children. President's Council Anuja Premaratna appearing on behalf of the former Defence Secretary Hemasiri Fernando said that his client did not receive notices and that he was representing his client in court based on reports published on newspapers. The Supreme Court, who considered the facts, ordered the counsel for the petitioners to hand over notices to the respondents again. The matter will be taken up for consideration again on the 31st of May. <laughs> Today, the Attorney General appeared on behalf of the third respondent, Priyalal Disanayaka, even though he did not appear previously. It was informed to court today that definitely the Attorney General's department will not appear on behalf of the IGP or the former Defence Secretary. <laughs> Now I have nothing to lose. I have lost the world's most precious thing in my world. I am appearing here today for such things not to happen again in the future. I wish the children of our country will never experience such tragedies again. I believe that the courts will do justice. Meanwhile, the Bar Association of Sri Lanka filed a fundamental rights petition naming the Cabinet of Ministers, the former Defence Secretary and the heads of security forces as the respondents. The petition was filed to understand if the state mechanism operated in a manner where the public were made aware of the necessary details under their rights to know information regarding the national security and the law and order of the country. A group of Catholic priests filed a fundamental rights petition at the Supreme Court stating that their fundamental rights were violated due to the April 21st attacks. The Prime Minister, former Inspector General of Police, the current IGP, the former and current Defence Secretaries have been named as respondents of the case. <laughs> As good shepherds, we were unable to protect our flock from these wolves. These wolves knowingly took the lives of 300 of our sheep. Today, we came here to file action against the violation of our fundamental rights by the dirty politics of the wolves. Still in news from courts this evening, now the Court of Appeal decided to dismiss the petition filed against Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe. The petition was dismissed over a number of reasons, including the failure of the petitioners to present original copies of the documents presented as evidence.
A petition was filed by Colombo Municipal Councillor Shermila Gornavala with the Court of Appeal seeking a writ of quo warrantos to prevent Ranir Vikramasinghe from functioning as a parliamentarian, citing he is a shareholder of a private company that entered into agreements with government institutions. When the petition was taken up, Council for Ranir Vikramasinghe K. Kanageshwaran, presenting parliamentary objections, pointed out that the original copies of the document presented as evidence had not been submitted and therefore the Court of Appeal does not have the power to take up the petition. Court of Appeal judges Shiran Gunaratna and Priyanta Fernando made the order to dismiss the petition filed against Ranir Vikramasinghe. Colombo Municipal Councillor Shermila Gornavala filed the petition against Ranir Vikramasinghe, claiming the latter cannot hold a parliamentary seat as he is a shareholder of a company printing cheques for two state banks. She is seeking a quo warrant or writ order stating that according to the constitutional provisions, Ranir Vikramasinghe does not have the right to hold his parliamentary seat. I will look into this order and consider if I can file an appeal on the matter. I did this for the general public of the country. I saw the things that happened in the past. People could file cases and claim for their rights to be protected. I could not present some of the documents required for the case. I submitted a request for the information under the Right to Information Act, asking for the original documents of certain agreements. But those requests were rejected. I could not get the documents that I needed. I believe that was one of the reasons for the petition to be dismissed. Now patients at the Kurunagala Teaching Hospital are suffering as the Kurunagala Municipal Council has halted the collection of garbage from the hospital premises. Officials at the hospital claim that the collection of garbage from the hospital was halted because of a personal dispute. While approximately more than 1,500 patients receive treatment from the hospital's OPD on a daily basis, more than 1,000 patients receive in-house treatment. Our correspondent stated that though garbage disposal at the hospital was the responsibility of the Kurunagala Municipal Council, it has been almost five days since garbage at the hospital was last disposed. <laughs> When the mayor had entered the hospital premises in his vehicle, the security division had made several inquiries. The mayor had then left the hospital without further comments. We were later informed that another group of individuals had visited the hospital and obtained information regarding the security officer who questioned the mayor previously. This security officer had also received threats. If the garbage of the hospital is not disposed due to a personal matter, we must say that it is very disappointing. We urge the authorities to take action to dispose this garbage. Failing to do so, the hospital will not be able to provide a service to patients and this will only add to your responsibilities. We are receiving complaints from residents and patients. Together with all these complaints, we will lodge a complaint at the Kurunagala Hospital under the Public Nuisance Ordinance. I received a complaint regarding one of my health officers who had injured his fingers due to chemical waste. I went to the hospital at around 5 in the evening on the 18th or 19th. The hospital security division informed us that vehicles were not permitted to enter the hospital premises. As the mayor of this town, they did not grant me permission. I then inquired from the health officer whether the garbage disposal vehicles were given permission to enter the premises. She said no such permits were provided. Therefore, I have given instructions to proceed with garbage disposal activities after obtaining entry permits to the hospital. When the mayor's vehicle was not granted permission to enter the hospital, how will garbage disposal trucks enter? <laughs> Are these the public representatives elected by the people to speak on their behalf? A revelation on Action TV. Charlene Benedict joins us with the details.
Thank you, Joel. Now, during the previous Yala season, to ease the burden of uh, farmers and purchasers alike, uh, the Ministry of Finance grants uh, the Ministry of Trade and Commerce 75 million rupees to purchase potatoes uh, from the farmers in the Badula district. Now, while the Ministry of Trade and Commerce has under its purview institutions like Lanka Sathosa for this purpose, uh, the Ministry hands over the responsibility of purchasing these stocks of potatoes to a cooperative society known as Coop Fed. Now the Coop Fed was given the 75 million rupees to purchase these stocks of potatoes and they did purchase 2 million kilograms of potatoes from the farmers in the Badullah district. Now later they informed the ministry that 1 million of these stocks of potatoes that they purchased were spoilt with no evidence there was no evidence on the purchase of these stocks of potatoes or the perishing or the destruction of these potatoes and no material evidence of the remnants of the potatoes that were supposedly spoilt. Now this complete deal amounted to a loss of 82 million rupees. Representatives of this cooperative society known as Coop Fed were summoned before the Cabinet Committee on the Cost of Living. However, not a single representative was present before this committee. There are no responsible officials in this cooperative society who could provide answers for these questions and there are no provisions to compel them to, be, to appear before uh, the Cabinet Committee on the Cost of Living as they are not public representatives. Now, the next question that uh, begs to be answered is the fact that were these farmers paid in full for their uh, produce that was purchased? Uh, the simple answer to that question is no, they weren't paid in full. In reality, the finance ministry has to allocate an additional 30 million rupees to uh, pay these farmers for the rest of the produce that was already purchased. Now, uh, through this entire deal, the Ministry of Trade and Commerce has been successful in wasting a total of 105 million rupees of Sri Lankan taxpayer rupees. Now, uh, at the end of the day, this is what the ministry has done. Now, the direct responsibility of this financial mismanagement should be held by the secretary to the Ministry of Trade and Commerce who authorized and created the, created the environment for this deal. What will happen next? Action TV will maintain a close watch. Well, thank you very much, Charlene, for that revelation. We move on with more stories. Now, Japan's highest circulated English daily, the Japan Times, has featured Gum Matha as a Sri Lankan initiative that the world can learn from. Penning his thoughts on Gum Matha was Dr. Robert D. Eldridge, Deputy Assistant Chief of Staff, G7 Government and External Affairs, Marine Corps Installation, Pacific Marine Forces, Japan and visiting scholar at both Okinawa International University's Institute of Law and Politics and Hosei University's Institute of Okinawan Studies in Tokyo. In his article, Dr. Robert D. Eldridge says he sees great potential for such a nationwide partnership between the private sector, media, universities, NGOs and local municipalities to address problems here in Japan. He said, quote, particularly there are many things that need to be done, including cleaning up Tokyo streets, subway and train stations and other things prior to Japan hosting the Olympic next summer. It would be great to involve everyone in that effort." End quote. Dr. Eldridge also said that he hopes Japan and other countries can learn from Sri Lanka's private sector efforts to address public policy issues. I, I think it's unique. So you had an academic approach led by media working with local partners and, and local individuals. So I think it was a really unique um, effort. The model that uh, Gamada and you know the initiative and V-Force uh, suggests is that it could be you know maybe nationwide or covering a very large region. The living example that it represents, uh, I think many countries or many uh, or other organizations in the world can learn from it. So the fact that it's been up and running and for close to six years now, I think is uh, a testament at how good and sustainable the organization is. And uh, the fact that so many young people were, were, um, were motivated to participate and volunteer um, 
it, it suggests many good things about the future that they care enough about, uh, you know, about the future to, you know, donate their time and energy. Um, the motto of the organization, uh, you know, the courage to care, I think is something that is applicable to any situation around the world. According to the latest review report of the IMF, the Sri Lankan economy remains vulnerable to shocks given high public debt, large refinancing needs and low external buffers. According to the IMF, public debt is estimated to have increased significantly to about 90% of GDP at the end of 2018, reflecting weaker economic performance and the sizable depreciation of the rupee. Sri Lanka's debt-to-GDP ratio remains higher than the median for emerging economies and gross funding needs are the third largest among them. Based on the latest available data, as of the end of 2017, the financial obligations of non-financial state-owned enterprises are estimated to be at 11.8% of GDP. The report adds that Sri Lanka has more than 200 state-owned enterprises, while the Ministry of Finance only publishes financial performance of 42 non-financial SOEs. The three major state-owned enterprises, the Ceylon Petroleum Corporation, the Ceylon Electricity Board and Sri Lankan Airlines recorded a combined loss of 1.3% of the GDP in 2018. External debt is estimated at 59% of GDP at end of 2018, while the ratio of external debt to exports of goods and services was high at 258% in 2018. The report adds that financial consolidation envisaged under the EFF support program is projected to bring down the ratio of public debt to GDP from 90% in 2018 to 75.4% in 2024. On to a story making its rounds these days. Now, Huawei's founder, Ren Zhengfei, has remained defiant towards U.S. moves against his company, saying the U.S. underestimates its abilities. Now, speaking to Chinese state media, he downplayed the impact of recent U.S. curbs and said no one could catch up to its 5G technology in the near future. Last week, the U.S. added Huawei to a list of companies that the American firms cannot trade with unless they have a license. To bring you more details, we are now joined by the head of digital at the Capital Maharaj Organization Limited, Bhutika Senesekura, to talk more about this. Mr. Senesekura, how is this going to affect the Huawei users? Yeah. Initially, there is no immediate impact to the Huawei users because uh, Huawei is uh, trying to work with Google closely in an in a, in a immediate solution just to provide the updates and uh, necessary technical support and help on the device users, for the device users. So there's no immediate threat of uh, uh, device users getting into trouble. But long term, the situation will develop and we have to see, it looks like that the hardware and software restrictions, especially Google Play and uh, browser-based uh, other facilities that they need to access, even it can even be extended to Google other facilities like Google Maps and things like that on these devices will be a concern. But we need to see how the situation uh, develops. Uh, now, at the moment, Huawei is in uh, communication and, and in discussion with Google uh, on, on providing a temporary solution without it having an abrupt exit uh, from, uh, from the device usage. So that's how uh, it stands now. Right, also, uh, Mr. Bhutikana, Huawei is the second biggest smartphone maker in the world, and losing its access to the Android operating system could jeopardize its smartphone business uh, beyond China. We would also like to know what are your thoughts on this? Yes, uh, smartphone access in China will be affected in terms of Android is concerned, not only in China, Huawei has a quite a presence outside China, especially in this region and to some extent into Europe as well, though uh, US is uh, not uh, impacted much on that. But on the other hand, the potential Android market is uh, not US because US has a very uh, a large market of quite loyal iOS or the Apple uh, loyal users which cannot be penetrated that easily. So even for Android, for Google, the best 
target market is still Asia and this region. So as I see that if, uh, uh, if there's an alternative, I'm made to understand that Huawei has been working on their own operating system. The readiness of that to launch immediately is not yet unknown, but it's sure to happen. And if it catches on, which will be directly competing with the Android market in this region, which at this moment I believe that uh, uh, Google will take a bigger hit compared to uh, Huawei on, on this area. Well, some interesting facts. Uh, but finally, on this uh, saga, actually, uh, the U.S. Uh, Commerce Department has given the company a 90-day extension to provide support for existing handsets and network components. Finally, we would also like to know what does this whole thing mean? Okay, 90-day is a negotiation uh, uh, effort that they are doing to provide, keep on providing the updates and all that. So it's not yet very unclear what happens after 90 days because since it's at the negotiation table, but of course the U.S. Co uh, Commerce Department is putting a lot of pressure on Google and at the moment even uh, Huawei says, we don't believe that it's from Google. So they know where it's coming from. Uh, but uh, it's all to be seen that how they arrive at a, a possible uh, a resolution to this, if possible. But at the moment, it, it looks that, I mean, after this time period, uh, Huawei is going to have an initial tough time with their devices, support, and the usage of. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Budhika, for joining with us with those insights this evening on Primetime News. With that being said, it's a time for us to wrap the news. More news follows on our website. That is www.newsfirst.lk. I'm Joel Outskun. Take care. Good night.